Thank you very much, uh, Robert, and thanks a lot for the honor and the opportunity to be here today and, and uh, speak to you about uh, the results of our assessment um, reports. And uh, there are three of them, and this is the first time we are trying to develop an integrative picture uh, with the key messages from, from all uh, three of them. Now, I'm doing this from the point of view of Working Group 2, emphasizing one important aspect, certainly the impacts of climate change and avoiding the impacts of climate change and their severity should be guiding emissions, ambition in mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation meaning the reduction of emissions and, and keeping climate change uh, within limits. This has already been emphasized in the special report on global warming of 1.5. And uh, the messages from, from this, and you have building on what Pan Mao has said, we can say since pre-industrial times, human activities have already caused approximately one degree of global warming. We are already seeing consequences for people, nature, and livelihoods on all continents and in all oceans. And at current rate, we would reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2052. Um, and there is one message that is also important. Past emissions alone do not commit the world to 1.5. If we would stop one, uh, global emissions today, we would be able to stop global warming. The special report on climate change and land uh, looked into this a little bit more closely with respect to the, the land sector that is supporting all of us and its uses and against the background of its very intensive uses already, which are non-sustainable by themselves. So there is a demand and there needs to be a request uh, to convert this in, into sustainable land use. And the diverse patterns of land use are just indicated here already by these two completely different uh, colors. Land is a critical resource. We rely on it for food, water, health, and well-being. But it is already under growing human pressure. Climate change is adding to these pressures. And you can see this illustrated in, in, in this figure, where actually I'm talking about the drylands that are already, that are currently covering 46% of the global land surface and are home to 3 billion people. And what we see here is a growing population. What we also see with the intensity of land use, we see an increase in dryland areas that are annually in drought. And climate change may already contribute to this changes. At the same time, we see a, a decline in the inland uh, wetland areas. So the total land surface is under human pressure, and this pressure by itself is not good for sustainability and for the maintenance of ecosystem services. We've already heard that worming over land has occurred at a faster rate than the global mean. And the current use of land loss and, and loss of biodiversity are unprecedented in human history. Climate change adds to these challenges. So this is a double whammy that needs to be considered. Urgent action would buffer the negative impacts from over-exploitation of uh, resources. And restricting warming to well below 2 degrees would greatly reduce the negative impacts of climate change on land. It's as simple and as complicated as that. But some mitigation options would increase competition for land. And I will go and into that later, resulting in societal challenges. Now, what, what are we doing? How are we going about assessing uh, the changes and the challenges? We are doing risk assessment. And we are using a simple uh, color code to bring the complexity of the information that is available into a very simple uh, uh, message. And, uh, and especially our stakeholders are the climate negotiators at UNFCCC. And they need to understand what's going on. And their measures are simplified. They talk about the change in global mean temperatures, as we all know from the 1.5 versus 2 discussion. And they want to see everything in all regions and sectors be in relation, depicted in relation uh, to this. So we compare undetectable risk white 
moderate risk yellow, high risk red, and very high risk purple in terms of this simplified color code. And we work with well-defined transitions, defining the transition phases between those risk levels according to the impacts. They are with respect to the land, land sector, two sectors emphasized here, the wildfire damage, where already at 1 dB global warming, we have an increase in fire weather season in several places. We have seen that during the last, during this year, the last few years already. And then if we go even further, go beyond 2 degrees, there's for, for some places like the Mediterranean, we can say there's over 50% increase in area burned uh, in, in those places. And if we go into the very high risk area, then there are over 100 million people additionally exposed to this challenge. Food supply for humans is also an issue. This considers that climate change already affects the productivity of crops, and we already see moderate to high risk. We are close to a transition to high uh, risk levels. This affects many sectors, including economics. Um, if there is less food, there will be an increase in food prices. There will be price spikes that affect individual countries, that is already going on. <clears throat> if we go into higher temperatures, there will be food shocks across regions, and then if we go even higher, there will be sustained food supply disruptions globally, because production essentially, and that is the start of it all, um, is collapsing. And then we go to the next special report, the IPCC report on ocean and cryosphere, in, in, um, in a changing climate that comes with a general message telling us that the world's ocean and cryosphere have been taking the heat, and that's literally so, from climate change for decades. More than 90% of the heat taken up by the globe has been going into the oceans. And the consequences for nature and humanity are sweeping and severe. This concerns various uh, processes. It starts from the melting of the glaciers in the, in the high mountains. It combines with the melting of the ice sheets in the polar areas. Both of them contribute to sea level rise, the changing um, uh, seawater, uh, changing freshwater supply is coming from the melting, melting glaciers. And then uh, the oceans connect all of these, these impacts. And then there are additional direct impacts of climate change on the oceans, causing marine heat waves, periods of extreme temperatures, just like we have heat waves on land. There's the increase in, in sea level. There is a reduction in Arctic sea ice, which has implications, uh, may have implications for global climate. And there are physical chemical changes in the ocean, like the heat content is increasing, ocean pH is decreasing, because the ocean is already is also mopping up CO2 from, from the atmosphere, reducing climate change there at the expense of ocean acidification. And then oxygen is declining because of increased certification. So our life-sustaining units, and this concerns 80% of the Earth's surface, our life-sustaining systems are responding. They are changing from the top of the mountains to the depths of the oceans. And these changes will continue for generations to come. We are looking at the impacts of, of these changes, and you see the physical changes summarized here for different areas across the world's oceans. And you see in all of these places, there are changes of these parameters, and they are having impacts. For impacts, we don't have a complete picture for all systems here, and the ecosystems affected are indicated here on the left-hand side. But there is this overarching impression of, impression of a reddish color. And this reddish color means the impact is negative. So there is a trend for negative impacts. For some places, we don't really have enough information that from the observation, and maybe there, there hasn't been any changes uh, in, in, in the respective systems yet, but there in many places, we already see the human business, if you so wish, activities building on those changes or building on those services um, being affected negatively as well. And this concerns virtually all regions. Now, there's one ecosystem that is especially sensitive, and these are the warm water coral reefs. 
And what you see here is a healthy reef on the left-hand side, very colorful, rich in biodiversity. And the fish stocks of such a healthy reef are important for small-scale artisanal fisheries. When it gets too warm, you see a change in color. And this change in color to white is called bleaching. And what it has is representing is that these corals, these animals, lose their power plants, which are unicellular algae living in those animals. And these algae take the energy from sunlight and provide the animal uh, with organic food. If these power plants leave the animal, it's starving. It can do that for a certain period of time. But if it takes too long, it's dying. And the system turns into something like this. It's completely different, overgrown by algae, and in low in biodiversity, and low in fish stocks. If we do the risk assessment for that system, it's not looking good at all. We are already in a high risk area, have been recently. Such bleaching events have been coming back and back and back at large scale, uh, uh, repeatedly already. And uh, uh, 1.5 versus 2, so the Paris Agreement temperatures take us into a very high uh, risk space for that system. Other systems are less sensitive, like the mangroves. Moderate risk starts for them at 1.5. But then the dependent human activities, and especially dependent on warm water calls systems, they also move into and starting to move into a high risk area here. The projections take that into account. We can actually say, even in a 1.5 degree warmer world, there's a high risk of losing 70 to 90% of spatial cover by coral reefs and their services to humankind, be it coastal protection, be it fisheries. And there will be even higher losses at 2 degrees. And you see, even from high up, that's the picture behind this. From space, you can see these large bleached areas in the world's coral reefs. Luckily, the good news is that this is, at the moment, the only system where we know that is really hardly hit already by climate change. Other systems are affected as well, but not to the extent. And you see the risk thresholds. They, the turning of red is happening beyond the 1.5 to 2 degrees temperature range. This goes across various marine ecosystems, from kelp forests to abyssal plains, helping us to say, yes, Paris Agreement has made a good move. The decisions made with respect to global mean temperatures keep many of these systems in a functional state and their ecosystem services for humankind as well. And this can be said with relatively high confidence. So for each of those transitions, we are evaluating the confidence levels. Let's move to sea level rise. Sea level rise, we see and we can compare what's happening between the recent past and the future. And if you do that in a schematic way, it becomes very clear what's happening. We have mean sea level rise, which may not mean such a lot. But if it combines with storm surges in places such as Hong Kong, this can mean that the sea level rise will be rising very high during extreme events. And the intensity of ex extreme events is also increasing. Under recent conditions, we may have had a one in a century extreme event with respect to sea level, which with rising sea level plus the extreme event on top may turn then into a one in a year event, so becoming more regular and challenging adaptation capacity. And the way this is happening, this is actually already observed to some extent. The dark dots here, especially in the lower latitudes, and your area is also included. The coast of Japan is also in included. Is already indicating that sometime earlier during this century, with the moderate sea level rise that we've already seen, uh, we uh, get an increase in frequency of extreme events. And this will be even higher under extreme emission scenarios with the higher sea level projected. We can do risk assessment for these places that are being exposed to these sea levels and to what extent they are able to handle this. 
So we can talk and we are comparing here prominent places like research the rich coastal cities, large tropical agricultural deltas, Arctic communities, urban atoll islands. And what you see here is a comparison of the risk development without or with moderate adaptation, just as present activities maybe, and then compare to a situation where we go into ambitious adaptation in order to reduce risk to a maximum extent. This will be very successful for resource-rich coastal cities like Hong Kong, and the adaptation measures will be costly, yes, but it's affordable, and the resources are there. Think about building, uh, building hard seawalls um, as a protection um, measure. But it's not looking as good for tropical agricultural deltas. We see high risk level uh, even developing with ambitious adaptation, even more so for Arctic communities, think of the Aleutian Islands, and for urban atoll islands especially. And there is an element coming in here, the red is representing the adaptation measures with people staying in place, but then if we look at the, uh, the light green area, here is indicating that people have to move. So there is relocation happening. This is considering relocation in a region, because this is a sensitive issue. It has been a sensitive issue in the negotiations with governments. We are not considering the need for international relocation, which may actually also be on the horizon for some of these places. So risk development may not be fully stopped by adaptation. And this means that by adaptation, we are not eliminating the risk, but we are buying time until the risk threshold reaches a critical level, and the degree of how this is buying time is indicated here. And it's a very obvious conclusion to say, yes, if we go from the high emission scenario to the low emission scenario and still doing ambitious adaptation, the amount of time we can buy is maximum compared to other situations. Now let's go a little further, look at other sectors. We have talked about warm water corals and their dependent small scale, low latitude fisheries. We should also indicate Arctic regions are under threat. We've heard that Arctic temperatures are rising much more than the global mean, with the respective impact on those systems, including the loss of sea ice. Coastal flooding risks are developing progressively over time and uh, it can't really be quantified for any, any temperature yet because we don't have a full understanding of the system. All present sea level projections may well be conservative if we are support, uh, surpassing uh, tipping points of the melting of the Antarctic and Arctic ice sheet. And then there's one aspect I would like to emphasize that is the direct impact of temperatures on human physiology, humans, in extreme heat combined with high humidity are not able to survive long term. So we are losing not only habitat for species, but we are also losing habitat for humans. Overall, there is less loss in damage at 1.5. Let's look back at a comparison of 1.5 and 2 and look at biodiversity. And in these comparison here, the dark green areas indicate all of those places where actually 1.5 would be beneficial over two degrees for the conservation of biodiversity. So there is a good news here. If we are ambi do ambitious mitigation, we can uh, conserve biodiversity. And it could, would be similar in the marine realm, although we don't have the data for 1.5. What we see here is that already in a two degree world, the grayish areas indicate where we are losing biodiversity, also reflecting the loss of coral reefs, and especially the coral triangle and the uh, places are, uh, north between Australia and Asia are being affected. If we go into f four degrees, we will be essentially clearing the low latitudes from biodiversity. These are developments over time which can only be compared with situations during mass extinction events in Earth's history. And already biologists are talking about humans pushing the planet into the sixth mass extinction event due to a combination of many human influences. So there is something to be considered here. There's also a redistribution happening of marine resources. 
fisheries are moving, animal biomass is moving, the lower latitudes are becoming less prominent in terms of representation depending on the climate scenario. And this also has implications for fisheries catch potential. There is a lot of fisheries productivity at the lower latitudes, and there is some gain in the high latitudes uh, towards the Arctic, at least transiently, because that is where the fish stocks are moving. All animals, including yourself, you're trying to be and stay at the temperatures that you prefer. If it becomes unpleasant, you move. So we can say changes in the ocean cause shifts in fish populations. This has reduced the global catch potential. In the future, some regions will see further decreases, but there may be increases in others, although some, some of this may be transient. Communities that depend highly on seafood may face risks to nutritional health and food security. And then we move into the management space. We can do something about it here by reducing other pressures, such as pollution. Or we do proper fisheries management and set up marine protected areas to maintain ocean productivity. But all of this will work only if we also go into ambitious climate mitigation. So where do we want to go? We can summarize. At 1.5 and even more so at 2 degrees, there is disproportionately high risk for Arctic, dryland regions, small island developing states, and least developed countries. Even so, there is a comparative difference between 1.5 and 2. Lower risks for health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security, and economic growth at 1.5 versus 2. So there is an economic benefit of staying at 1.5. And a wide range of adaptation options can reduce climate risks. There are less adaptation needs and a better exploitation of adaptation capacities at 1.5. At 1.5 compared to 2, we will have smaller reductions in crop yield. We already talked about that. We have less population exposed to water stress, up to 50% less. And we will have less population exposed to climate-related risk, including <coughs> poverty. So again, an economic dimension susceptible to po being susceptible to poverty has something to do with the degree of climate change. And there is a lower impact on biodiversity and species. So in the following and after coffee break, I will continue to talk about this on emission pathways and system transitions consistent with global warming, but that just to come up with these strong messages. If we want to keep to the Paris Agreement and to 1.5, CO2 emissions fall by about 45% by 2030 globally from 2010 levels. There are several countries that haven't done much since 2010 and that will feel challenged by this statement. To limit warming to 1.5, CO2 emissions would need to reach net zero around 2050 compared to 2075 for two degrees. And we've heard from Pamao already, reducing non-CO2 emissions would have to be part of this and would have direct and immediate health benefits. This brings us to a comparison of the respective scenarios. And the respective scenarios include one important aspect. We need to go into negative emissions beyond 2050 anyway, depending on the amount of CO2 that we have pushed into the atmosphere. Depending on how ambitious we are with immediate emissions reduction, this quantity is increasing. Some of this is taken up by forests and agriculture, and some of this may need to be complemented by the use of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. And the less ambitious we are, the more we need this process. Storing carbon dioxide underground will be important, but there are trade-offs. If we need a surface area, like in this case, two times India, we will run into problems with food security. So early entry is important for emissions reduction. And what is also important is to consider to avoid an overshoot. So reaching 1.5 by 2100 should not mean to run into warming of 2 degrees and then go back, because the impacts will develop over decades and will be similarly strong and high and severe as if we would be staying at 2 degrees then. 
And with that, thank you for your attention so far. This is to be continued after <laughs> coffee break, talking about solution options and governance. Thank you. <laughs>